Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and have a chance to talk about uh, this theme. Um, and so I will launch right into it. Okay, so I'm going to do this in six parts, but they're not just maybe seven parts, but they're not, of, not all of equal length. So because some of us are archaeologists and archaeobotanists and some of us are not, I thought I'd briefly introduce what, <coughs> what archaeobotany is. Then I'm going to talk about progress in the study of plant domestication through archaeobotanical evidence, what I would call conventional methods, because things have advanced a lot in the last couple of decades. And so get a sense of where we are. And then I'm going to talk about the, some of the new lines of evidence that we can generate using these new techniques like uh, uh, high resolution x ray computed tomography, uh, including a bit of uh, work that I was involved with on a, using a synchrotron in the UK and with colleagues in Australia using um, micro CT scanning. So I'll, I'll talk through those case studies. Um, so I'm not going to, I don't know why it says. By the list of inset, I'm not going to talk about that, but I hope this is the right PowerPoint. And then I'm going to talk about new developments in the study of cooking and cooked foods, um, which so far we've used through SEM, but which have potential using three-dimensional uh, imaging methods. Uh, and then, then I'll conclude with so, just some sort of random thoughts on future directions, and then hopefully we'll have time for discussion. So yeah, six parts, not seven. There's an extra, extra one in there. So what is archaeobotany? So archaeology. As anyone who's an archaeologist will know, and most of you will also know, is the excavation and study of past sites of human activity. Uh, so recording the stratigraphy and, and studying all the finds and artifacts and lines of evidence that come out of that. Archaeobotany is, is particularly, a, I would say, a subset of archaeology that uses botanical methods to retrieve and study uh, the evidence for plants and plant use on those sites. Now, most often we deal with material that's preserved by being charred in the past, so that differentially destroys some evidence. That means we're left with woody parts and hard, hard seeds and nutshells and hard bits of chaff and things like that. And we recover that material by concentrating it because it's dispersed as small particles in the sediment. Uh, and we concentrate that through flotation, so mixing it through water and using buoyancy. And so on this slide, there's pictures of uh, a machine flotation system at Chatelpuyuk, a new of site in Turkey I worked on for a number of years. And uh, when I was much younger, doing bucket flotation in Orissa in Eastern India. Um, so it's a kind of very low tech method of concentrating the charred material, catching it on fine sieves. Plant macromains tend to go down to about 250 microns. So they're quite large compared to what people uh, using x ray imaging usually look at. But that, of course, provides a potential to look inside that material. And there's a nice example of, uh, of some charred rice spikelet bases about. 200 rice spike the bases or something like that, and a single rice grain. So you know what a, the size of a grain of rice is because you've probably eaten it. That's on the right of that lower photograph. And the rest of the spike the bases, which attach the rice to the plant. And the spike the bases, for those of us interested in domestication, are kind of gold dust because they tell you whether the plant is wild and has a wild seed dispersal mechanism or is domesticated in the sense of being dependent on humans to harvest it and plant it which is really a uh, key change that we're interested in studying. So some of the kinds of things we can use this to study, by no means exhaustive, I would say the most common thing that uh, lines of research that I've been involved in is this tells us about what people ate. So what plant foods are on those archeological sites? Are they fruits and nuts? Are they cereals? Are they tubers? Are they flax seeds? What combination they were? What were they farming? So are, they cult are these wild foods they collected or are they cultivating cereals and flax and legumes, rice, depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh, and then we can also say things about how they were farming. So we often use our ability to say, well, they're irrigating or manuring these fields, or they're not. It's rain-fed agriculture or irrigated agriculture. These kinds of questions uh, are very common for archaeobotanists. And then, but because we have the remains of the plants themselves, we can also ask questions about the evolution of crops over the long term or the evolution of the weed flora. And so I'm going to talk a lot about that last bit, the evolution of crops. Uh, in this talk, because I've been uh, quite interested in that in uh, recent years. Okay, so now we're on to part two. So plant domestication and the expanding archaeobotanical record. Um, when I was a PhD student, I finished my PhD in, in 2000, really, early 2000. Um, we sort of thought there were a few centers where plants were domesticated. Domestication happened very few times. It happened very rapidly. Uh, it was kind of a non-question. You know, you could have said, the archaeological question was, let's get plant remains. Do we have domesticated crops in agriculture? And it was a yes, no, tick the box or not, you know. Um, 
I would say in the last two decades, we've come to realize that, of course, it's an evolutionary process that takes thousands of years. So that's thousands of plant generations. So that's hundreds of human generations. Um, and things are changing. So there's a lot to unpick that box of domestication and understand it as a protracted process to compare it across different crops, uh, compared across different cultural contexts and different geographies. Um, now, essentially, we can do that by looking at some of the morphological differences that are obvious between a modern domesticated plant and its closest wild relatives, or what we would often refer to as wild progenitors. And that's things that I've already referred to. So things like seed dispersal. So in this picture on the left, you have a series of barley spikelets in my mm -hmm. wild barley spikelets in my hand. So this is kind of freshly picked off the of wild barley plants in, in, in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. And you can see that each of the spikelet has a single grain inside. And the ones that are sticking in the soil there in the middle are as they fall into the soil, they're shaped like little projectile points, little arrowheads. And they're weighted so that if you drop them, they will always fall point down and they're covered with little microscopic hairy barbs made of silica that allow them to dig their way into the soil. And given time, they literally will dig their way into the soil because the wind will blow them, animals will vibrate the ground and they will drill themselves down over a period of uh, days to weeks. And so they're designed for getting shattered off the plant when they're mature and sticking themselves in the soil. On the right is domesticated barley. You can see it's all dry. It's all held together. It's all still on the plant. It is sitting there waiting for a human being to come along and harvest it and to thresh it to break the grains apart and then to plant those grains. So its reproductive cycle has become dependent on the intervention of, of people. And so that's a kind of hard domestication trait, which is typical of most cereals and to varying degrees, there's a certain amount of spectrum of all domesticated plants. So they become increasingly dependent on humans for uh, their reproductive cycle. That of course makes them good to harvest. You get a higher yield if you're a person. Uh, it's good from the point of view of the plant in that they can then, people will spread them about to places where their wild progenitors wouldn't go. Uh, and so it's a, it's a kind of co-evolutionary process. Now we can study that through some of the morphological changes that result, uh, that come about uh, as part of that process, which of course are underpinned by genetic changes. Another thing that changes with domesticated plants is uh, seed size. So wild relatives and wild plants tend to have smaller seeds. And domesticated plants tend to have larger seeds. And the lower left is that along the bottom, wild barley, wild, what's the middle one, wild melon, and wild pea, and at the top, some domesticated varieties. They're not, they're not necessarily bigger in all dimensions, but they're fatter. Uh, and basically, we think that's because uh, it's driven by a kind of level playing field effect. You clear the soil by tilling it, you put seeds in it, and the competition is all amongst those seeds of the same species, which means the ones that have bigger seeds more quickly establish larger seedlings. They capture more soil, which is where the nutrients are and the water is, and they capture more leaf area, more sunlight, and they sort of crowd out their siblings. Uh, and so there's a selection process for larger seeds. Now, of course, we can study by simply measuring them. Seeds get bigger over time. I'll show those data. Then we know from modern studies that there's also things in some plants that are, which involve physical changes related to dormancy. So many plants, if you take a wild, Wild pea, like that uh, one down here, it's black. It's also got a thick ornamented seed coat. And that seed coat is hard and doesn't allow water to penetrate the seed. And so it doesn't allow it to germinate because it doesn't get any water. So it will sit, the wild peas will sit in the soil for five years, 10 years, 15 years before they germinate. Um, the domesticated one has a thin seed coat, permeable. And so it will germinate as soon as it gets wet. So if you've ever germinated beans, you know, as a school experiment at home, you stick them in a dish of water, they germinate within a week. The wild ancestors won't do that. And that comes about through physically through a thinning of the seed coat, uh, which allows that permeability. It also removes various chemicals, usually involves a change of color. But of course, archaeologically, we can't see color because the seeds are generally all charred, so they're all black. But this just shows some SEMs through a section of, of, a, of soybean, so a domesticated or wild. So the outer seed coat, if you think of the wild soybean, it's very, very thick. And the kind of uh, uh, alirone layer with those palisade, palisade cells uh, is, is very thin. And then the, and that of course allows water to percolate around the seed, that layer. Uh, and then in this, this one, it's, it's uh, much thinner in the domesticate and actually the percolation layer, if we call it that, is much, is, is a bit bigger. So it's allowing that water to get in and germinate quickly. So that's something we ought to be able to see over time. But the problem is it's on the inside of the seed cup. So I'll come back to that. So that's one of the new directions that we're now, now using these new technologies for. 
So where have we been? So if we go back to the end of the 20th century, where were we? You know, we, we knew there were things like differences in seed size, even differences in seed of thick, thickness, but the approach tended to be a typological one. It tended to be, it is or isn't the domesticated type. So these are examples. So here's North American domesticates published in Science in 1989, the earlier ones. And you see it's not, there's no sample size or standard deviation or mean. It's sort of like, I've looked at a few specimens from this side at this date, and they are small, these are small seeds. And then these are large seeds and they're across this dashed line, this kind of nominal threshold that this uh, scholar created. He said, they're longer than this, they're the domestic. So it's, it's either wild or domesticate. So even though he's dashed that line there, he doesn't have an evolutionary process. It's, it's kind of not a statistical test. It's just a kind of, is it or isn't it? And he's done that for a number of things. So this is Iva annua, that's an extinct crop. So never mind that, that's sunflower. Uh, at the Kinopodium, so kind of the North, North American version of quinoa. And this is actually seed coat thickness. This is the only seed coat thickness study that really existed back in the uh, 20th century. And that was from finding broke lots of archaeological seeds, some of which were broken. So you could kind of see a little bit of the seed coat and say, oh, it's thin. So it's thin around uh, less than 20 microns, or it's thick around 50 microns. So again, it was an either way. And similarly, this was uh, some work uh, by, by a colleague in, colleague, in the, colleague in the UK, Sioux College, measuring wheat grains from early sites in Jordan, saying, okay, the, the ones with thickness and breadth that are on the lower end, those are the wild ones. The ones on the upper end are the domesticated ones. So there's a kind of threshold. There's an either or. Uh, things started to change in a kind of pivotal paper. It was very short. I think it was what they used to call a, they used to call a science postilla or something. It was like a one page paper. Brief, brief brevia, science brevia. I don't think they have them anymore. Anyways, I published two images in it from a, a, a George Wilcox, who's based in France, now retired, and, and Kenichi Kano, who's a Japanese postdoc working with them. And they, they worked on three sites, uh, Caramel, uh, El Kirk, and Kosaka Mali, and uh, Forsyth in the Valley Tori. And what they did is they were looking at the rachises of wheat, of einkorn wheat and said, well, you can see some with the smooth wild type scar shattering and the um, rough torn scar domesticated, but they actually counted up the proportions and said, well, in the earlier sites, they took a couple existing published data sets which were actually not of wheat, they were barley. So this graph is curious in a number of ways. It combines two different species and says, well, we can just put them together and assume that they're evolving in the same way at the same time in the same space. But anyways, that's, it was, it was really good. But anyways, you have the the indehiscent domesticated type in purple, the dehiscent or the shattering wild type in dark blue, and then ones where they weren't sure, but were possibly domesticated in light blue. And, you can see, and that's, that's a time series. And so you can see that there was this change and it was a gradual change. So they, they said, you can't just say typologically wild and domesticated, we need to look at it at a population level through time. So that was actually a kind of uh, watershed moment, I would say. Um, yeah, but of course they're combining data from a number of different uh, crop, but well, two different crops. And, one different crop. um, and that kind of let the floodgates open for people to start to think about this stuff, including myself when I was younger. At that point, I was just starting to work in China and I just started a, a collaboration on this, on this site called Tenlo Shan, which was discovered in 2004. And I, we did field work, including systematic archival sampling in 2006. So just as that paper came out and it's a waterlogged site, that's part of it there uh, in the picture. And in amongst that waterlogged material, there's lots of wild foods and acorn nutshells and things, but there's also lots of rice and lots of rice spikelet bases. And prior to this, no one had even tried to recover rice spikelet bases in China because, again, the question was, was is it wild or domesticated? If an argument is wild, it's domesticated. They usually just assumed it was wild. They didn't think, well, we should try to find the attachment scar and ask, is it a smooth, dehiscent type with that round scar? So that's a modern one. That's a waterlogged archaeological one from the site. That's a SEM of a carbonized archaeological one. Or the, the, the domesticated type, which is ripped out because it doesn't shatter. So people have to break it, thresh it, and it tears. And so these are the domesticated types, modern and archaeological. And then we get a third category, which um, I argued was probably immature green harvested. right? So that could be either way. So it's harvested before it's ready to dehiss, perhaps. Wow. So we had all three on the site. So then it became interesting to do a sequence and we had three phases of the site so we could count them up. And uh, you know, the, the sample size was something like 2,600. It's all across the bottom for the different phases in total. 
And so then for each, for each phase, you have multiple samples across the site that are roughly the same age. So from that, we can get what is the average of that period, what is the standard deviation. So that's what these data are. And this is the non-shattering type increasing and the wild type and the uh, immature type increasing. At that time, there was kind of nothing to compare it to. So I got a hold of one sample from a much later site and said, well, this is where it's headed towards domesticated up here at like 70% uh, and, and very low proportions of uh, immature and lower proportions of wild. Um, this of course then led to a kind of strategy of let's compile existing data because there was some data out there. Let's go back to old assemblages and count stuff up. Uh, and then we can start to look, think about rates of change. So it's an evolutionary process. How fast is it? Um, and so like this is a compilation I was involved in compiling and I think it was published 2010. So this is grain size. We also said we could look at grain size, right? So this is grain size, assemblages mean and standard deviation, maximum up here, minimum down here for barley in sites in the Near East through time. You can see on average, they go up and then they kind of level off. Sometime they level off sometime around, let's say seven or 6,000 BC. This is einkorn wheat, averages going up. And then this is the non, as of 2009, this was the non-shattering data we had. We had those three data points for rice at Tim Lashon. Uh, which were large assemblages, and we had these barley and wheat assemblages from the Near East. And so we published this, this data. Looking back at that now, it's like very few sites, very few assemblages, small data sets, but we could at least start to see that there were similar slow evolutionary tendencies in two different parts of the world uh, involving at least three different crops. Uh, and this, this just shows the kind of, you know, the, uh, the end point and the beginning point of kind of average einkorn wheat grain size getting fatter and thicker through time. That's from uh, the site of Abu Huraira from the lowest level to the upper levels. Um, we, we then uh, played a game of using those to calculate rates of evolution, what's called the Haldane rate. So it's a rate of phenotypic change per generation, which is basically a shift. in if you imagine a natural distribution of a biological trait as a normal bell curve distribution, so it's got a mean and then a, a distribution around that standard deviation, that's a shift one how then uses as a shift in a standard deviation unit in one generation, which of course is very, very rapid. Nothing's evolved that fast. So everything's a kind of fraction of one, but then that allowed you to standardize. It's kind of a scale free unit, right? It's not changes in percentages or changes in millimeters of grain thickness. And so you could compare across crops and across traits. And so this is our first attempt to come up with kind of how they rates of evolution of various crops. I'm not going to digress on that. It did. The one thing I would point out is that it did assume a constant rate of evolution. And one of the future directions to really start to recognize that evolution isn't constant, it's constantly fluctuating, right? Because environments change, cultural techniques and technologies change, and the plants are adapting and the cultures are readapting to those plants and environmental conditions. So of course we expect evolution to be um, directional, but not uh, stable in its rate. Uh, this is just a snapshot of sort of where we are now. By no means all the species, but species of large data sets for seed size increase. And this is percentage and increase in the mean of populations. So and you can put lots of species on one percentage graph. And this is a uh, percentage of non shattering. So we've got two species of wheat, icon and wheat and barley and rice, uh, some sorghum and pearl millet data from Africa here, uh, and various crops for size. So you can see that they're starting and ending at different times, the rates of things like seed size increase on average are not the same for all crops, but the kind of directionality is there. So that's sort of the snapshot of where we are uh, today using what I would call conventional methods, which is identifying things, counting up qualitative differences, quantifying those, quantifying metrical differences. Um, and those, so that we can do things like uh, compare across, within a crop across traits and across a region. So this is just an example of barley from the early barley from the Near East, separating out different regions, what data we have from different regions of barley. And you might look at that and say, well, we have a lot of data from the Southern Levant still, Israel, Syria, Jordan, uh, not so much from Cyprus or Central Turkey or, or the East in, 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 in Iraq and Iran. So there's still some patchiness geographically, so we can target that as archaeobotanists and archaeologists try to fill that in, if it's possible to go and uh, sample in these areas. And this is the, 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 the grain size increase. So from those, we can then look at the rates and say there's, certain, there's a certain sub-period where change is most rapid. So that's what I've labeled as the episode for the different traits. That's the kind of period of most rapid change. Uh, and so we can start, this is stuff I've been working on recently, trying to calculate how they rates, but over subsets of that 
distribution. So take every three or four data points and say, what is the rate over that period of time? What is the next three or four data points? And what you get is the kind of variable rate. So the rate of evolution, the rate of morphological change is changing through time. So high rates, low rates, high rates and low rates um, for different crops. Then you can, so, so what are the periods when it's quick evolution in barley size or quick evolution in barley racus or quick evolution in wheat racus or quick evolution in pea uh, and, and see if they overlap geographically, chronologically and, and uh, culturally, and then start to think about what's driving it. So that's a kind of rough compilation of in 250 year bins, when you have the fastest rates of evolution in cereal grain, rate cereal grain size, other crop seed size. So interestingly, there, there is a kind of core period when most of the crops from the Near East are evolving most quickly. So that then there's a question about what are the underlying cultural correlates, how are cultures adapting that or driving that? So does it correlate with things like uh, diversification of sickle, sickle types and sickle complexity, which is, this is basically a, a, a Sickles are for harvesting and in the old days, it was that sickles drive domestication. This kind of turns it around and says, well, domestication actually drives sickle evolution. So sickles, as you move up the scale, become more complicated, more steps to produce each sickle grain, more specialized tools adapted culturally to harvest things that are domesticated. So again, it shows that co-evolutionary thing. So that's the sort of direction of travel for where we are, I think, in domestication studies using conventional methods. There's a lot more to do, especially gathering more data especially expanding to more crops in more world regions. There's a lot of data from the Near East, as you've seen, some data from China, much less from India, much less from Africa, much less from the Americas. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, but so far, this work is focused on two traits, really, non-shattering <coughs> in cereals, where we get the spike that base is preserved, and uh, seed size in sort of anything. So there's other really key traits, like that loss of dormancy and seed coat thinning, which this isn't getting at. Uh, and it's also true that some of those regions of the world, like Africa, have less data because there are less of these seeds recovered and preserved. So are there other ways to get at that information? And the beauty of these new, uh, of these, uh, these imaging methods, these x-ray methods, is they're allowing us to get new data from old collections or from existing collections in two different ways, both in filling in gaps geographically, as we'll see with Africa, uh, and that's work that um, I'll come on to in a little bit that I've done with uh, colleagues at Australian National University in Canberra. They're working on African ceramics to get evidence for crop domestication there. And then, uh, and then also looking inside of seeds to look for seed coat thinning, which is work that we did some pilot work on uh, with at the, the synchrotron in the UK at the Diamond Light Source. So I'll talk to both of those. So, I guess everyone here will be familiar with what the synchrotron is. I usually in my archaeological lectures do a few slides on that. Uh, so I, I presume you all know, understand what synchrotron is probably much better than I do. Uh, it's a, well, I would guess in the old language we say it's a nuclear accelerator, it produces high powered x rays and allows you to look into things. And that's much more complicated than that, but that's the easiest way. So this is, these are some pictures of the, the one at Didcot. So we wrote, I had a postdoc, Charlie Murphy, who appears in some of these pictures. I think that's her in the distance there, loading a, seed in, um, who came to me, I guess, in 2014. And she said, oh, I just saw this paper on imaging fossils inside rock without taking the rock or plant fossils. Isn't that really interesting? Do you think we could try something like that with seeds? And of course, part of her postdoc, I, one of her assignments, she was a postdoc on an ERC project I had, was to uh, work on uh, legume domestication in India. So we were getting lots of archaeological legumes and modern ones, and she was measuring them and doing lots of measurements. I guess you measure a lot of stuff with, drives you a bit batty. And so she was looking for other things to read to take her mind off. So she came across that and said, couldn't we, couldn't we try this? Maybe we could look inside and do the seed code. Wouldn't that be interesting? So we wrote a, uh, you know, one of these proposals to Diamond Light Source for bean time. Uh, and they, uh, they thought, we've never heard of this archaeobotanical stuff before. Why not? We'll give you, we'll give you a bit of bean time. Uh, and then we went and had our, our two days of bean time in 2015. I can't remember the exact date. It might say it on the next slide. Uh, and in, 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 we didn't know any of them. So it was just by email correspondence. Uh, they determined that we should be put on this beam line over here, which isn't even in the main range. So I never got a full, we never got a full tour of the main facility. We were, uh, you know, we were using this I-13 beam line, which is a very, 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 very long tube, but it had been used for uh, kind of biological imaging of things. Yeah. And they said, because it has 
include contrast imaging for low attenuating elements and partial coherence. So yeah, that's a 250 meter long tube. Anyways, um, so there's a bit of background that I've already mentioned that seed coat thinning is something we know happens. We've seen this picture before. That's the domesticated wild seed, seed uh, soybean. This is just an example with modern seeds. Here's a wild Canopodium album, uh, fat hen. It's a common weed all across Eurasia. It's got a black seed coat. Uh, it's also got a thinner seed with pointy edges. And um, as a proportional, it might be hard to see this photograph. That's one I just, you know, section. The, seed, the black seed coat is relatively thick compared to the overall seed thickness. This is a domesticated one, and it's a cultivated domesticated crop in parts of the hills of Southern China, Southwest China and Yunnan, and also in Taiwan. So the material, the sample I have here is from, from Taiwan. And you can see the seed is bigger. That's one of our traits. It's kind of rounded at the edges, but it also got a change in color of the seed coat, and the seed coat is much, much thinner. So we knew that this was a trait. And of course, this has been studied in the past, as I mentioned, in North America, by work by Bruce Smith back in the 80s, uh, using the SEM at that time on specimens like this. So he'd go through archaeological samples, say, oh, here's one that's broken, so we can mount it in such a way that we can measure the seed coat because it happens to be broken. That, of course, means you're picking out the rare broken specimens, and you know you can see <coughs> one little bit of the seed coat and estimate the measurement from that. Um, so we thought, well, if we could look inside the seed, non destructively we could measure the seed coat everywhere around the seed and make it more quantitative, more precise. Uh, so that's what we set out to do, and we thought we'd do it with a species called horse gram, which is an important uh, bean crop in India. Uh, it's called horse gram because the British didn't really like it. Uh, so it's also considered a poor man's crop. It's an under-researched crop. So it's one of these crops because it was denigrated. It's never had a lot of research put into it, but it turns up a lot archaeologically. So in modern India, it's about the fifth most commonly cultivated crop, and archaeobotanically, it's uh, like the fourth most commonly found crop from prehistoric sites in India, but it's the least discussed in research. So we thought that would be a good, interesting candidate for those sort of reasons. Also, it often preserves archaeologically with the seed coat. The seed coat's undamaged. So, uh, and so what we did is we mounted a bunch of these. That's a modern one. We mounted a bunch of archaeological ones on the end of little needles using, uh, I think we used fingernail polish in the end. And then this is Charlene loading it into the chamber, and that, that's the needle with the little thing on top, and then it was uh, x-rayed with the synchrotron. Um, this was done in 2015, and we didn't really know what we were doing. I think the, the beamline scientists who helped us, I mean, they obviously knew what they were doing, but they didn't really necessarily know what we wanted to get out of it. So there was a little bit of, maybe we didn't quite approach it in the most efficient way. But anyways, um, this is us doing that, you know, learning to uh, both to uh, you know run it through the machine and then also to do the computed tomography to get the slices later. This just shows an archaeological modern and SEM. And then these are the kind of slice images we got, which are not really great now, but they were good enough that we could measure the, the seed coat thickness on a bunch of these. And so we published that in uh, scientific reports initially. The thing to note is we didn't have a very big sample size. You know, it was 13 seeds, but out from those 13 seeds, we, we got able to get lots of measurements on each one. So we did, we have 550 measurements. The thing we didn't do, which you would do today, is segment it. We didn't segment the images. So we took the slices and, you know, we worked out there about 4,000 slices per seed. So we took every 200th slice and we measured six or eight times around. And we took those as a kind of sample, a kind of judgmental sample. There would be obviously better ways to uh, do that. Uh, using segmentation and, and to get many, many more measurements. But anyways, from the, those data, we can see that, so these are those, each of those seeds, the mean and uh, standard deviation of those thickness measurements plotted against the age of the specimen or the estimated age of the specimen. And you can see this gradual thinning. And then these are some historic ones we had early centuries AD, which are much thinner. In fact, we, we kind of concluded it's a kind of step change. These are kind of thick, these are kind of semi-thick, and these are thin. This one's also thin. And then the data set at the top was the other data sheet they're generating, which was measuring these seeds. So seed, uh, I think that's seed, what it, seed width, uh, and that's in millimeters. So they have 500 measurements, so about the same time. So you can see that the seeds are getting bigger, seed cuts are getting thinner. And the, the, where the places these, the sites these beans come from are down in South India down here. And the red shows the approximate wild distribution. So we have a domestication sequence for this crop. Uh, we then went back and had a second session 
we wrote for more bean time. We said, we really need to do more, more horse gram, but we'd like to do some other things too. Um, and we got really excited to do, we did some Chinese kinopodium. I uh, was still, uh, which do serve seed filtering. We haven't published that data. We did a few lentils from the Near East. We did a, a sequence of, of Chinese soybeans. Uh, this time I realized that when you have only two people, because only the two of us went, and we had 20, we had 48 hours on the bean. Uh, you can't stay awake for 48 hours. So there's a lot of downtime where we weren't producing. So we went back the next time I took two more postdocs, and then we had someone who came partway through to help us out. So we had a kind of constant churn for our all of our bean time. We used all of it that time. Um, and then we, we published a kind of methods paper here with uh, uh, Bodhi and Rauer, both of the bean line scientists, talking about what we've done in both times. Uh, the other thing, you know, when we were there, we said, well, you know, hitting it with high radiation, is it going to excite the carbon in there? Is it going to turn carbon-13 back into carbon-14 and screw up radiocarbon dates? And uh, Christoph Rao, who's the, one of the physicists of mind, said, I don't know, I've never thought about that. Hmm. So I just thought, well, we could do a very easy test. So, so th this, we took soybeans, the ones with the stars, were put in the synchrotron and blasted for 45 minutes or whatever it was. And the ones without the stars were from the same flotation sample that had not been in the machine. And then we just said, well, just AMS state all of them and then you can compare. Uh, and there's no significant change. So here's a series, I don't know, there's one synchrotron one and a bunch of others in the same context. They basically fall together. And that was true at two different sites. So we're pretty satisfied it doesn't affect being able to synchrotron it, then take it out and send it off and directly date it. So that's a, that's a good thing for, because archeologists always want to be, make sure we can date our specimens if, if you know, because that can be important. <clears throat> important. Um, and so I got some really good results. Not all of what I have to say is written up yet. That's on my plate because I'm still getting around to it. Some of these postdocs have moved on to other things. Um, we didn't normally do nice uh, reconstructions, but uh, Bodhi, who's one of the beamline scientists, said, oh, you could quickly put all the slices back together and make these beautiful animations. So I still need to learn to do that myself. But anyway, that's an example of a archaeological soybean from early in the sequence of something like uh, close to 3000 BC. And it's still thick seed coated uh, and looks a bit more like the wild type. But with these, we started to play with, do with some segmentation. So that's an example of a segmented soybean where you, then you can kind of automate the uh, measuring of the seed coat and you get hundreds of thousands of measurements from each seed. Um, and so the, so the soybean data was, again, it was a, really a pilot. So we have here we have seed coat measurements on six soybeans, two from one site, but otherwise of different periods. You have the mean and standard deviation. So again, we see thick seeded early and thinner seeded at the end, and what looks like what could be interpreted as, as a gradual process. The data below was previously published data on soybean size. Now the time scale on these graphs did it. That's are different. That's 5,000 BP. So here that's 3,000 BC here. But if you look at seed size increase in soybean, it is this period. So at least some of them are getting bigger, and that's the period where we're seeing thinning. So again, it it fits with a domestication period for that problem. Um, okay, so that was one direction. That was, the, that was the kind of synchrotron adventure that I had. Um, and we still have some data from those because we get so many images, it takes time to work through them. So we still have, I have another former PhD student who's working on the Kenopodium, Chinese Kenopodium data still with other data sets that she put together. So that's on the list. Uh, was uh, getting new data from much older data sets, and this was looking inside ceramics. Uh, and this was to look at both the domestication of pearl millet, a very important crop in sub-Saharan Africa, which originates in West Africa, somewhere like Mali, and sorghum, which of course is a very important crop in Africa, but also in other parts of the world, and uh, originates somewhere around uh, Central or Eastern Sudan. Um, so this, this gives a, a sense of a distribution. So the hatched area is traditional cultivation where it's an important crop. So Sub-Saharan Africa, India, sorghum also goes into North Africa. There's a little bit cultivated in bits of Spain and Italy and Northeast China and even Japan and Korea. Uh, of course, in the New World too, it's a major uh, cattle fodder crop in places like Mexico and Texas today. So it's an important global crop. We don't really know the origin of that. Pro kind of archaeogenic point of view. And then pro millet comes from West Africa. It's, ex it's particularly important because it's highly, highly drought tolerant. So most drought tolerance here. So the places they grow it in northern Mali or Sudan, where you have 150 millimeters of rainfall a year. You can still get a crop of pearl milk out of that. So, uh, and it's grown in the most drought prone parts of India. So it's an important crop, but it's also an important uh, staple food for the first food producers in West Africa. So, and these are the sites 
traditionally where we have the earliest finds of it. Now, one of the challenges is that the environment in which it comes from is one that is it's the Sahel. So here's the modern Sahelian, Northern Sahelian kind of vegetation in, in Sudan. And of course, we know that uh, through the Holocene, the Saharan desert expands. So the Sahel retreats. As the Sahel retreats, it becomes desert, which has massive events of wind-blown sand, and that tends to scour your archaeological sites and remove stratigraphy. And that means you tend to, they become deflated, you tend to lose stratigraphy, you lose preservation of plant macrobes. So most of these sites have zero or very thin stratigraphy. There's no organic preservation, no chart, very little chart material preserved. So you don't get the traditional plant remains, but you do get the artifacts, the stone tools and the pottery. Um, and luckily in the Neolithic, very often, pottery was tempered with plant material. So you take your chaff or other plant material and you levigate the clay, you add it to the clay to give it, to bind it together, uh, which is not uncommon with kind of handmade uh, low fired ceramics. And so when it's fired, then that the organic material partly burns away and leaves behind the kind of fossil of, of what was that chaff material. So we can use the ceramics to look for uh, these crops. Now, this is something that we've been doing for a while anyways, but we've only been working by old fashioned methods of looking what you could see on the surface, making silicon rubber casts of impressions on the surface and hoping that they happen to be sorghum or pearl millet or happen to be the right bits of the plant that we could say something interesting about it, um, which is still useful because it's very low tech, low budget. You can do a lot of, just lay that on the table with a simple microscope, you can do a lot of that material, but it's, um, not the most efficient at recovering kind of high quality quantitative data. Uh, and this is where our collaboration with a colleague at ANU in Australia, um, in Canberra came in to kind of try, try out some new techniques using a micro CT scanner to look inside the pots. So these are the sites we'll, we'll talk about. We'll talk about some sites in Eastern Sudan, especially KG23. And we'll talk about a few sites in Northern Mali, especially AZ22 and uh, in case 36. Uh, uh, it says here with the dates. Now, both of these, all these collections of ceramics are old in the sense that the archaeology was done in the early 80s. Um, so KG23 was excavated by a Southern Methodist University, University of Khartoum collaboration in the early 80s, back when America and Sudan were friendly, which is a long time ago. And those ceramics were kicking around storerooms in Southern Methodist University or wherever. Uh, and then eventually were donated to the British Museum for whatever reason. Uh, so they came that way. So it allowed us to go back to this old material that was gathering dust and had been studied. There was nothing more to do with it. Well, there was more we could do with it. And the, the, the work in Mali was by a French uh, project, French team working in Northern Mali, really on paleo environment and climate change and, and drying aridification of the Sahara in the early eighties. And they collected lots of surface material and that was sitting in storerooms in, in uh, uh, in, in Toulouse, anyways, in the south of France. So we've been able to go in and, and kind of, in a sense, re-excavate, re-examine these ceramics and get new information out of sites that have long been finished. Um, so I'll just walk through these two cases. Here's where KG23 is. So it's kind of between Khartoum and a city called Kassala. It's on a paleo, a dry paleo channel that feeds into the Atbara River here. And the upper of course comes off north of Ethiopia and then joins the Nile north of Khartoum. Um, when the work was, here's what the site looks like on Google Earth today. So it is a, it's an impressive kind of natural mound that then has kind of about a meter of archaeology on top of it. Um, it when it was excavated, they didn't do archaeobotany as we do it today. They didn't float, unfortunately. They did collect fauna, and the fauna is interesting because it's basically a hunted fauna. Uh, you know gazelle and hares and, and so, so forth, some warthogs. In the very upper level, there's a little, a few bones of sheep, goat, and cattle. So it looks like it's at the transition to pastoralism, and most of it is pre-pastoral. It's also curious for this part of the world because there's no fish on the site. So most sites in this period that are, are better known are near the Nile Valley, and they eat a lot of fish. Um, here, it's a probably seasonal river, and they're not really eating fish. But it had a lot of ceramics. Uh, and Frank Winchell, who did a PhD on the ceramics on the site back in the late 80s, we only published it much more recently, kind of moving towards retirement, he said, oh, I need to publish my PhD. And he worked on the ceramics. He had found that about 20% of the pottery was this type, this Cordag plane. 
type, so not decorated, but heavily tempered with plant material, including chaffy type material. So you'd see some of the work that we published on uh, chaff impressions from elsewhere and sort of got in touch and said, well, I think that a bunch of this stuff is not chapter, but might have sorghum in it. Could you take a look at it? And it's being donated from, being shipped from the US to Britain anyways, to go into the British Museum's collection. So maybe you could look at it first before it gets lost in the British Museum basement. So that's what we did. So you know, he, he picked out 92 sherds that he thought were uh, promising. I don't know, maybe he picked out 147 sherds of those. When we looked at them, we found 92 sherds with some sort of plant impressions on the surface. And we did a first paper on that in 2017. And we said, okay, it's about one third indeterminate, one third wild, one third domestic. Uh, and then um, it was after that that we got in touch with uh, colleagues in Australia, uh, Professor Tim Denham and his PhD student then, Alice Barron, who were exploring micro CT uh, uses um, for archaeology there. Uh, and they suggested that they could try a few shirts to see what they could do to look inside, not just on the surface, but inside. So we sent them 12 shirts. Uh, so this is what the kind of shirt impressions look like on the surface with conventional photography. You can just kind of see that's bits of chaff. There's a bit of a, a spike of base there, a rachis. You know, there's more bits of chaff. Maybe the rachis is smooth, maybe it's broken. It's not the best way to study it. The conventional way is to then make casts of that with silicon, so you get a positive, and then you can bold coat them and SEM them, so that looks like this. So here's one, we've got two, two husks, so two bits of chaff and a torn rachilla. That's characteristic of domesticated threshed sorghum. Here's one with a smooth uh, spiked at base, so that's characteristic of wild sorghum. So that's the work we've done and published in 2017. That was comparing, looking for smooth versus torn rachilla. But a lot of times from the surface and from these kind of things, they're, they're partial, they're incomplete. You can only see bits of them. You can't turn them over. They're not, not three-dimensional objects. They're just whatever happened to be stuck on the surface. Um, and there's a lot, a certain amount of indeterminacy in them. So here's here's some ones that are domesticated. Here's, uh, that's a, I guess, a, a wild one. But what it did indicate clearly, and we argued with 27 people, was that this was chaff, 2017 papers, that this was chaff from the dehusking and winnowing of, uh, of processing sorghum. And so this is traditional you know, dehusking of sorghum. It breaks off the gloom so they can eat the grains. Then you've got this nice chaff product, which can be used by the potters to mix with their pottery. So we know they're using this stuff, but could we get more out of it by micro CT? Uh, and you know, sometimes it's like hmm, wild type, probably domestic type, probably you know, it's a little bit hard to tell. Okay. Anyway, so this is just some examples. Uh, you know, I had a postdoc, Chris Stevens, who went through these over and over and photographed all of them and. You know, we looked at the SEMs again and, and we would argue about whether it was domesticated or wild. It wasn't always easy to tell. And some had no impressions on the surface. So when we published it in 2017, uh, and we did another site nearby from another from an Italian project, Casa K1, you can see the white here is the indeterminate. That's where we say, yeah, it's a bit of sorghum, but we don't know. We can't tell. We can't even agree whether we think it might be wild or domesticated. And then the wild ones are the blue and the domesticated ones are gray. Now, prior to this work we'd done, there'd been previous work with some impressions of sorghum, mostly wild, but very, very, very small sample size. So that was the state of play in 2017 when we sent these 12 shirts off to Australia. Um, and of course, what they did is, uh, so what they've been doing at that point in 2017, you can see Baron et al. So this is the Australian group published a paper at around the same time in 2017, where they took a, took a shirt or a few shirts from a Neolithic site in uh, Vietnam, I think, Anyways, in Southeast Asia, I think it was in Vietnam. So here's a, they took a piece of a shirt and they stuck it in a micro CT scanner, and you could separate out the, or, the different densities of material. So the organic component in green, or maybe that's the mineral component in green and the organic component in red. And in, this is Vietnam. And in Vietnam, they could go through that organic component and find the rice husks and sort of se uh, segment out the rice husks. So here's a rice spikelet that was used to temper ceramics in Vietnam in the Neolithic period, and they were able to pull these out of shirts. So this, this was sort of where the, the, the idea came from. So they were driving this. So like, we can get in, inside the shirt and find the rice husk temper. Uh, so a follow-up study to that, but again, at least better than others, take a single shirt from a site in Dua Sira is Indonesia. Um, and so here's the Dua Sira shirt. And you can see there's lots of organic material in there. In this case, the organic material is in green. 
and you could pull out all the individual rice spike with basin. So she could segment out and get high resolution um, models for the right spike the bases that were in the interior of the ceramics. And then we could look at those spike the bases, you know, domesticated type. Mostly they were domesticated type. Some were wild, one was immature. Because I'd done that work on physical spike the bases in China, they got in touch with me to say, oh, can you check what we've called wild and domesticated using the criteria? So that then gave us gave the idea of, of they argued that a single shirt could be a whole archaeobotanical assemblage because from that you had 50 plus rice spike the bases, which Pretty good for one flotation sample, but that's one shirt sitting in a museum somewhere. Uh, so it was, that was the background. So then, then it was like, okay, 12 shirts from Sudan. So there, uh, Tim Denham and Elise, she's now finished her PhD, and she was the one who did all the uh, tomography work in terms of um, sitting at the machine, but especially sitting at the computer, like processing those the machine. And this is the, some pictures of their facility in ANU. So the basic question for us was, can we get more information out? And obviously the answer is yes. I'm also not gonna explain what a micro CT machine is here because there are people in the room who will uh, correct me when I make lots of mistakes, but essentially it's a those very similar one that I saw yesterday. It's, um, you know, it, it's producing an X-ray. You put your sample in front of the X-ray. It's de detecting it there. The longer you leave it in, the higher resolution you can get. But of course there's different resolutions within the machine, built into the machine but you could get down to you know, one micron or something in that sort of order. And then they use this software that they were working with in Australia to do that. So the samples were put in a, in a, in a tube. I mean, if they were in fact stacked in a tube. So they stacked several shards in one tube uh, and then um, obviously scanned them. Um, and the point really was to separate out the clay of the pottery from the mineral inclusions that are harder, things like quartz sand and the organics and or casts that around the organic stuff is burnt out. So this is just one, one animation of one of these examples that they that at least produced for us. Um, and then of course, once you've segmented all that stuff out, you can then remove the, let's remove the clay component and just leave behind the organic component there. And then once you've got the organic component, you can focus in on the individual um, fragments within it to say which are the ones that look like sorghum spikelets. And then once you've got those sorghum spikelets, you can look at those in quite high definition. And unlike the surface impressions, you can turn these around and look at the spikelet base. So it's unambiguous that's got a torn reticula of the, of the domesticated type. Whereas the surface impressions are sort of like, is that a torn reticula? I'm not sure, because it's not all there. So it was much, much higher reliability and it reduced our indeterminacy rate a lot. Um, so this is an example of, of one of those shirts. So some of the impressions on the surface versus what you could see from the interior. So suddenly from a shirt that might have one ambiguous impression or two on the surface, you have uh, several in the interior, which are unambiguous. So that just shows another an animation. of it. But these are some of the then results. So you could pull out each of these specimens and say, okay, that's a wild type, domesticated type, wild type, a threshed, broken, domesticated type, et cetera. Um, that's something else that's not a sorghum, that's like an echinacoa or some other grass, right? So, um, yeah. And so what that did is allow us, and even when you have mixed, so chaff, of course, gets mixed together. So here's two fragmented bits of chaff, both in wild type, but they're kind of, one spike the base is here with the torn glue, one spike is here with the torn glue, you could kind of disentangle those. So you could really see a lot more. Uh, and the and really key things in the graph and those statistics. So if we look at what we published in 2017, we had, I don't know, 50, 51, and about a third of them were indeterminate. Uh, and then in this study in KG23, that produced 83 from only 12 shirts, and, you know, 5% or less were indeterminate. And it increased the number of identifiable sorghums per shirt to about seven, whereas before we had less than one. So it was a much higher uh, return rate. Um, so that was great. Now, at the, now I, I think at that point, uh, maybe Elise was kind of winding down and finishing her PhD. Uh, and so at the same time we sent them that, we sent them a little bit of stuff from the French material from Mali, not as much as I wish we had, but here we're looking at a very similar process. So here's a wild pearl millet, smooth scar down here. Domesticated pearl millet has three things that change. You get a torn uh, peduncle, it's called a peduncle, it's actually a different plant part. And instead of having one grain in here, you get two grains, so you have paired spikelets. Uh, and then of course the grains also get fatter. Um, 
that. So we're kind of looking for those kind of things. And previous work I've been doing, these are the kind of surface impression approach where you peel bits off surface impressions. So here's paired spikelets. Here's one with the Tor and Rakilla. So these are all from surfaces of the site in Mauritania. Uh, and then this is a site in, in Mali. We've got that bit of the Tor and Rakilla, Tor and Rakilla site. This one probably has a, uh, this one from Sudan. And then there occasional grains, but grains are really rare. So like this site at Kerkritsch and Kastnor, we had two grains. AMS dated one and measured two, a very small sample size. From the surface of the pottery, we had, I think, nine impressions that we can identify as domesticated or wild. So again, very small sample size. Um, and so we had this new material from the French collections in the south of France, like AZ-22, uh, and these cover a, a range of, uh, of different periods. Uh, and so uh, she looked at those. So we had, we'd already been working on AZ-22. So we had surface impressions by SEM. These are them here. Most of them sort of look like wild pearl millet, or you couldn't really tell because you can see these are kind of broken off. Uh, so we needed to look inside. Um, and that's what we did. So from a single shirt from AZ-22, uh, it was just chock-a-block full of pearl millet uh, uh, casts inside. Uh, and they are all single spikelet, narrow, and all have a smooth base. So they're entirely of the wild type. Um, and there were more she could have counted. She could have limited based on time how many she could go through, but they were 100% wild. And then we had these two other sites where, again, uh, we sent them, I guess, 10 shirts for micro CT from this site and none from this one. And I regret that. But in any case, these are two slightly later sites. Uh, but from the MK36, you can see, you get a mixture of wild types and domesticated types, as well as ones you can't tell, and some with paired spikelets, which is a kind of domestication trait. And this site is later at sort of, let's say, 3,000, 2,500 BC. If that's true. Now the dates, unfortunately, are old dates based on charcoal, so it would be nice to date, have new dates on these sites that are more accurate. So this, yeah, so this shows a paired spike loop. This shows a uh, a non-shattering type where it's torn. These show some wild type ones, and some with mixed features. So ones that have two a pair of spike loops but are shattering. So they're kind of mixed features in that of domestication. Uh, so it's still a small data set we're able to put together. You know, here are the ones, the appearances of non-shattering kind of maximum minimum estimate from various sites. These have none. And then paired spikelets, these have none. And then they're starting to appear at around 2,500 BC. And then from those, we can combine that with grain measurements from charred material, as well as the estimated grain measurements from within pottery. And you have a, 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 a grain size 10. So that's the average and standard deviation of the maximum grain size reported on archaeological sites. So we can see that there's that trend in grain size increase. And then those other kind of hard domestication traits uh, kicking in. Um, and a lot of that, although a lot of that data was without the micro CT, the micro CT stuff was, was really key because it, it grounded us in that this is 100% wild. Uh, and this site here is, start, is starting to get a mixture of domesticated and wild. So it was able to kind of uh, bookend that domestication process. Uh, and until we get more data, that's sort of where we are. Uh, and then uh, at least published earlier this year, a kind of summary of all of the methods they developed there that she worked on as a PhD, including these various case studies and others. So she's done some exciting works imaging uh, charred tuber fragments so that you can look at the tissue of, of tubers in three dimensions, uh, which opens a potential methodology for studying domestication of crops like yam and sweet potato and taro and so forth, uh, which would be an important direction in the future. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, because I've talked something else we've been working on not just in my lab but in my lab and in other labs across Europe is increasing interest in uh, the charred remains of foods you can think of this as those breadcrumbs that fall to the bottom of your toaster and get charred and accumulate right uh, it's this kind of stuff tiny charred specks of burnt bread and so forth they can survive and they come up with flotation and they end up in your flotation sample and so you have your grains and your chaff and your wood charcoal and you often have, not all the time, maybe half the time, maybe 30% of the time, something you have a few of these amorphous charred lumps. And archaeobotanists have tended to just set them inside and say, well, it's just junk. We don't know what it is. And then the larger ones that say, well, maybe that's charred bread, maybe that's charred food with a big question. So we, you know, thought it was time to start trying to systematically look at this stuff. Because of course, there are different ways of cooking things, porridges, flatbreads, leavened breads. These are Indian idlis which are steamed. These are uh, um, Indian water, which are 
deep fried, they're in fact the same ingredients, right? But they have very different textures as a result of how they're fried. Uh, these are examples of charred lumps. So these are nice big ones from the site of Chattahoochee in Turkey, which is near the site. So these are really big ones. These are millimeter scales and really several millimeters across. Those are exceptional, but you do get those occasionally. Uh, and it's clear that they have variable texture. So I, I set a PhD student a task of kind of working on this, Laura Gonzalez, who's now started uh, teaching at University of York, she finished her PhD a few years ago, just before COVID. Um, and with the, when her PhD title was something like the or a methodological approach to the origins of bread culture. And it was built on an, a, a kind of observation that if you look, look broadly at different parts of the world, you get different early cooking traditions. So if you look at East Asia, they have really early pottery back in the Pleistocene, 15,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago. By the time you get to the Neolithic and they're cooking rice, they've got really elaborate multi stackable steamers and things and they're you know, really set up for boiling and cooking. There's not an oven in sight. No site in, no archaeological site in China has an oven. Most kitchens in Shanghai don't have an oven, right? They, you wouldn't cook in an oven. What do you do? That, you know, what, what's that for? Right? It's not part of the tradition. And that goes right the way back to the beginnings of agriculture and before. Whereas if you look at the Near East, this area in red, we have these clay built ovens, these little taboon ovens for baking fat breads and naans and things. Um, and those are earlier than cooking pots at sites in the Near East. So you have a pre-ceramic Neolithic and you have pre-ceramic baking, right? So, the, so I, you know, I've written about this a number of years ago, but we didn't really have a way to approach that <coughs> botanically. So that's sort of what uh, Lara started doing um, by both looking at the archeological stuff from sites like Chachalhuyuk in Turkey, but then also doing experimental uh, recipes of making bread, making batter, making porridges, um, and then uh, charring them and then SCMing them. Um, so these are some archaeological examples of these different matrix types. And essentially we approach this like you might approach a ceramic thin section where you're saying, does the ceramic have lots of porosity? And is the porosity uh, kind of regular or irregular? Does it have lots of inclusion particles? And are those particle sizes regular or irregular? What's their model? What's their distribution, right? Um, and then doing the same with the experimental stuff. Uh, and so, in fact, we published a kind of semi-quantitative, qualitative set of charts we could use to estimate the percentages of voids, so those are your pores, as well as pore size, uh, pore size across the top, and then this is particle size and particle density. So rather than actually trying to count each one, it was a kind of, as, as you will find in kind of soil, soil science manuals or uh, ceramic analysis manuals, these kind of percentage model charts. So we wanted to do something that we could apply to this kind of food material, because, of course, food is quite irregular. It's not regular throughout, right? So if you're looking for tendencies within it. Um, if it tends to have small regular voids or large irregular voids, right? It tends to be cracked or not cracked. So you're looking for kind of semi-quantitative and qualitative descriptions. Uh, and that seemed to work for telling apart breads, so baked breads from batters, from porridges in a broad sense. And this sort of some results from chattel huyek, so this kind of thing with SEM where you zoom in. And you can also then see so you can both describe the, these are the bread-like products with these, lots of these small uh, micropores. Uh, and then you can zoom in on some of the particles in there and say, well, that's a bit of a charred seed. And in fact, it's got what looks like a, a, a kind of seed coat from a pulse. Uh, and here's another food fragment that's got a bit of what looks like aluron tissue. That's underneath the, the layer underneath the bran in wheat and, and barley is what's called the aluron layer. That looks like an aluron layer. And sometimes those are, there's enough material there. You can say, well, that looks like a wheat or a barley, or it just kind of looks like generic cereal aluron, right? So this is looking, this, you know, diff different levels of identification and some of these things. Um, this methodology then allowed, uh, uh, with a collaboration with, in fact, a, a Danish project out of the University of Copenhagen, Tobias Richter, some will know, is, has a project in uh, Jordan working on an early site. So this is a pre-agricultural site in Jordan called Shubakia One. So the date there is about 14,000, 14 and a half thousand years ago. So it's pre-agricultural, but they're starting to build some of these interesting kind of communal stone structures with a kind of pit oven. This is pre-regular oven, but a pit oven. And in amongst the flotation samples there, there are lots of these food wastes. So the, the postdoc who's doing the archaeobotany, Amaya Aranzo Otegui, came over to London partly to use our reference collection for Near Eastern seeds and then got to talking with Laura and said, ooh, maybe we should SEM some of the food. So this was done on our SEM in our department where they worked together on identifying these pre-agricultural breads. 
So sometimes people ask me, well, what came first, wheat or bread? And the answer is clear, bread came first, right? Or it came before wheat was domesticated. So this stuff is made with a mixture of wild einkorn wheat and sedge tuber, ground up sedge tuber starch, uh, and, um, and maybe some other seeds somewhere. So they're making flatbreads before they've domesticated wheat. So raises also an answer questions like, did they prefer to domesticate wheat because of the gluten content, because it made better bread? Why is it that all the gluten containing cereals were domesticated in the Near East or not in China or Africa, right? So it starts to, perhaps we can ask new questions. But anyways, it allowed us to take this back to a uh, very early. Um, we've done a little bit of work in other places like in this site called Hamadab in central Sudan. Uh, and there it was nice because we had a set of systematic citation samples that, uh, um, that they collected and one of my students helped collect a number of years ago. And out of 60 archivotanical samples, the samples with food was just about 30. So we were able to determine that 50% of flotation samples on this side had food. <coughs> so it's actually there's a lot of this material to work on, just hasn't been worked on. And some pre very preliminary work that Laura did here showed that we have, we did have some breads, but most of it had porridge type matrices. And mostly when you could identify bits of, uh, of plant tissue, it looked like it came from the surfaces of sorghum grains. So this is a sorghum <coughs> porridge culture rather than a, a wheat bread culture. There's a little bit of wheat bread, but uh, very, very little. Uh, this dates to about the first century, the AD BC, so the, the wheat is not necessarily described. Uh, so there's a lot more work to be done on this, and what we need is more controlled experiments of food preparations, more gathering of ethnographic recipes and ethnographic samples. There's a lot of ways that you can cook things that are sometimes quite surprising that we may not think about that people might have used in the past. And so uh, before all these ethnographic traditions disappear, we need to record them and think about how they would leave behind charred traces in the, ar 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 the archaeobotanical archeo record. So that's a direction that we're pursuing now. And I've got a, one of the PhD students here is one of my PhD students from Taiwan who's done some ethnographic work in Thailand with the Aka people. Uh, and then she's reproducing some controlled ex experiments in cooking pots of, of, diff of different methods for steaming and boiling rice that they're reported where we can control temperature and cooking time and quantify the content and all that kind of stuff. And then that's charred and SEM. It just does some other strange, that's a, a, a raised stiff porridge of sorghum flour that I photographed uh, earlier this year. Um, and so I think that the, the potential then, that we've been doing SEM work in this kind of semi-quantitative, qualitative description, which I think is quite powerful, and there's potential to take it a bit further perhaps with a three-dimensional approach, where you look through the entire fragment of food because then you can slice it and look in lots of lots of different views, not that one uh, kind of haphazard view that you have that you stick under your SEM. Uh, and you could potentially then start to quantify things in different ways. And this was a piece of food from charred food from South India that uh, Stephen Allen uh, and, and Michael Favell have, have put in a uh, micro CT scanner over the down the road or whatever in, in Husset yesterday. Uh, obviously, the full tomography is not there, but it just shows it shows some of the potential. So I think that's another direction we can go both with the ethnographic and experimental, and then also with the archaeobotanical. And I understand that a lot of these kind of tools are used by a specialists from the food industry. So there's probably also a lot of specialist knowledge on how foods behave that we could also collaborate with to better understand ethnographic and ancient foods. Okay, so uh, my summary is, is really that we have a, a you know, Plant domestication studies have been going apace in recent decades through an expanding archaeobotanical record, more species, more sites, more regions of the world getting involved. And we can continue to do that and should do kind of conventional archaeobotany, simple, you know, more data, quantitative time series and analyses. And that will continue. And, and some labs like mine, we will, that's our kind of bread and butter. That's what we, that's what we do. But there's also the opportunity to get new <coughs> domestication traits, things like seed coat thickness through using new technologies of imaging. That requires collaborations with those who are can do the x-ray tomography uh, and also we can get new data from um, perhaps surprising sources like inside churns that are gathering dust in the you know in a french or a british museum we can say well those could be really useful for parts of the world where we don't have other lines of plant evidence and we can we can get those through these uh, x-ray tomography methods as well um, we're in the early stages of developing this kind of archaeobotany of cooked foods and processed foods uh, and that, uh, I think, can also benefit from these new uh, imaging technologies by looking at them 
uh, in three dimensional, three dimensionally, and also through those interdisciplinary collaborations that that will create. I, and that's what I wanted to say today. <laughs>